thank you very much. My name is Desha Kim. I'm a professor of, of WE here at KAIST. Um, as someone who actually studies uh, neuroscience as well as machine learning at the same time, I'm extremely excited about the next session where we will be talking about the impact of AI on the culture. And obviously, culture is made up by humans. Um, so I would love to have a series of talks as well as discussions about how this new technology is going to impact the human civilization as well as the way of how humans are interacting with each other. It's, uh, it's an extremely interesting time. If you think about it, 300,000 years ago, we Homo sapiens came to the world. 10,000 years ago, Homo sapiens settled down in cities and villages. 5,000 years ago, we invented writing. 2,700 years ago, in Ashurbanipal's library in Nineveh, the first higher education or the institution for higher education was created. If you look in this way, everything that you see in this room was invented by humans. There was no divine touch. There was no mythical invention that came from the sky. Every single piece that's in this room was invented through human labor and intellectual endeavor. However, with the advancement of AI, we may have a situation where the next big inventions will be made by machines rather than by humans. There's a famous book with the title, The Final Invention. Why is it? Because maybe AI is going to be the human society's final and last invention, and all the next inventions will be made by machines. Is this likely? Is this unlikely? We would love to have a discussion about it. By the way, since they are still settling the chairs about lifelong learning, um, you know, being myself a big fan of uh, lifelong learning, um, I just wanted to, to, to play the role of the devil's advocate, and it just popped up in my mind whether it is really the case that every human being, every citizen, really wants and should be a lifelong learner. Maybe some people just want to be lazy. Maybe some people don't want to learn. Isn't laziness also one of the fundamental human rights? Um, so I would like to have a discussion about that as well. Why is it that we see the society always through the lens of academics, through the lens of universities, that every human being has to be like us? We are the minority, obviously. So let's talk about that as well. Is it actually permissible to have a discussion about the future society, industrial revolution, as well as uh, AI, always through the lens of us who actually benefited uh, from higher education? Um, I would like to start the uh, panel discussion maybe by asking the same question to all, all of you three, and afterwards maybe change um, the question to each of you guys, maybe in, in, in this um, order of the speech. So <clears throat> this panel is titled, as you can see in the program, uh, Who is Responsible? The Ethical and Societal Implications of Artificial Intelligence. So OK, big words. Now, as you will all know, very recently, um, two uh, passenger airplanes crashed. Boeing 737 MAX 8. And it seems like, again, the final technical verdict is not out yet. It seems like that a pseudo or um, quasi AI system called uh, MCAS, Maneuvering Characteristic Augmentation System, um, is responsible in that sense that uh, based on faulty sensor data, the AI system took over, did the wrong thing, the pilots tried to correct it four times every time the machine overrode, so to speak, what the, what the pilots did. So I think we already have cases where our trust in automatic systems or auto, autonomous systems designed in such a way that they would override the human decisions are already starting to impact our life as well as uh, you know, in other aspects as well. So my question to you three is, Based on your current understanding of where AI is moving, where do you see the biggest risks for the society in general, and maybe for the universities in particular? Maybe with Sean. Yeah. Um, okay, well, 
I think you could talk about risks on different timescales. Um, in the immediate term, I think what I'd be most concerned about, and I preface this by saying that I'm incredibly optimistic about the opportunities posed by artificial intelligence, and in particular, the need for the tools of AI to help us with many of the global challenges that we face, climate change, biodiversity, and so on, are all going to require tools to make sense of you know, huge amounts of data and complex interconnected systems. I have a concern that if we deploy AI too prematurely or too carelessly in too many contexts and make too many mistakes, we will lose trust in AI systems, exactly as you've said. I mean, um, Toby pointed to some examples of things that um, are very disquieting for a lot of people, like um, use of AI in um, you know, wide-scale um, facial recognition. Public trust is an easy thing to lose and a much harder thing to get back. And I would have a concern that if we, you know, if there's one too many self-driving car um, crashes or one too many cases of <clears throat> clearly unfair um, recommendations being made by systems that just haven't been either tested enough or deployed in the right context with the right considerations in mind, we'll lose that trust and we'll have a very hard time getting it back. And that will, in turn, inhibit our ability to actually really use AI for all the beneficial things that um, we could use it for. Uh, and I think that that's a real concern. So that's, I mean, that's right now, I think. Um, Looking a bit further ahead, I think there are big questions that um, scholars have been looking at. Um, Kai-Fu Lee wrote an amazing book that I was reading over Christmas, um, where one of the issues he raised is sort of geographical concentrations of power that might be affected by artificial intelligence if the hubs of developing AI are in particular parts of the world and you have jobs being lost in such a way that um, developing nations were able to make use of some of the tools of AI but not necessarily use AI to kind of climb up um, the ladder in the ways that have been possible in the past and then potentially affecting um, uh, global equality. And I, th I think there are a lot of open questions there, but I think it's something we need to think very carefully about. In the longest time scale, I think there are some questions about what happens in 2062. Mm -hmm. um, and if we do develop mm -hmm. AI that's as capable of all of us, well, we know what we've done to the world <laughs> and a lot of that's been um, positive, but not all of it has been. So anytime we talk about um, developing something as transformative as that, we need to think about the potential risks as well as the opportunities. But I think that's probably far enough away that it's an interesting scientific and kind of research question for you know, a smaller group of people. I think the questions that are really pressing that this community as a whole needs to be um, thinking about and across sectors are the nearer term issues that I've pointed to. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Chaeyoung? Um, what I think the, the most Im immediate risk is the misconception and the misunderstanding about the power and also the limitations of AI. I believe AI is a set of technologies um, that we develop, we create, and we use them. We need to be able to do that responsibly. Okay? And um, sometimes uh, we, we, we attribute the, 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 the problems, the issues to the technology itself, which is I don't think that's correct. Okay, looking at uh, the internet, okay, the social media, um, I believe we will need to examine the way we create and we develop and we use uh, the technologies, and, uh, and also looking at what are the framework on guidance or guidelines, government governance, regulation, and also uh, the responsible use. Um, and and uh, those considerations have to be uh, taken into consideration because ultimately the AI technologies and systems are used in a human context. We will be able to develop and also understand uh, some of these uh, uh, risk and, and consequences uh, of, of the, uh, how, how we're going to use it to in, in different areas. And I think that is the, the most Im immediate task that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Toby, so the biggest risk and, and maybe the, also the, the opportunities. Big, the the yeah. biggest risk is, is one, the whole planet is suffering at the moment, which is a breakdown in trust. We mm -hmm. don't trust our political institutions anymore, and we're starting not to trust our te the technology companies. Uh, and <coughs> we've had 30 years, you know, the internet was invented 30 odd years ago, 
Um, and we've had 30 years of, of amazing disruption mm -hmm. and innovation that has brought, it changed, transformed our lives, in, most of it in very good ways. But, but we're also discovering that, that not all of it is, is actually useful and good mm -hmm. disruption. And some of it is actually quite, quite bad and corrosive. And mm -hmm. it's, it's transforming the nature of our political debate. And we're starting uh, to go down a very dangerous road, which if we, if we start distrust, distrusting these sorts of technologies that... Um, that we may end up in a very bad place. Um, in the case of, of the 737, you know, the regulatory environment mm -hmm. is one that is broken. The, the, mm -hmm. the regulator allowed was too closely involved with Boeing um, and allowed a, approval of, a, of a, an aircraft that doesn't seem to have been safe. Mm -hmm. um, and the same will be true of AI. We will need to build the right sorts of regulational environment mm -hmm. in which the public can trust it. And they don't have to, they don't necessarily, as, as you say, they, you know, maybe they need to know a little bit about AI, about privacy and things like this, but, the, but you can't expect everyone to know everything about AI. Um, but, you know, just as we don't need to know everything about uh, water safety, and yet we can trust the mm -hmm. fact that the water coming out of our, our taps is safe. We, don't, mm -hmm. um, we need to, to have structures in place so that we can trust um, the, the responsible use of the technology. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the things that go down in Silicon Valley these days are things that... Um, we're discovering can't be trusted. I mean, what was the what was the um, motto of Facebook? Uh, break things and move fast and break. Move things. fast and yeah. move, move fast and break <laughs> things. Well, that was great when Facebook was only just trying to be a dating site for college students. Mm -hmm. But well, now it's actually the major form of news, and it is actually tr changing the way that people <coughs> vote in elections. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it comes with some responsibility, mm -hmm. um, and so we do need to think about you mm -hmm. know the. The five biggest companies on the planet today by market capitalization are now all technology companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have amazing reach and influence and ability to, to tr change our society. Mm -hmm. And um, we do need to think very carefully about you know, what sort of regulatory environment sure. that sits in and how do we ensure um, that people can trust them. Sure. So I, I think trust is an, is an excellent keyword. And I would like to come back to actually to the general issue of trust. But I would like to start with you, Jayan, mm -hmm. about specific trust in healthcare, because you are working in healthcare AI. Yes. I recently read a paper uh, by an Israeli group that actually used a uh, generative uh, <laughs> model, mm -hmm. GEN mm -hmm. model, to insert false positive and false negative data into medical imaging. CTs mm -hmm. and MRI, mm -hmm. where it was impossible for the expert actually to discriminate it from a true cancerous case versus, let's say, non-cancerous cases. So if with that possibility in mind, as well as hospitals and universities, you know, being totally open in general, mm -hmm. in healthcare, we are literally talking about the question of life and death. So if I go to the doctor and I get a three Tesla MRI scan, and the doctor gives me a thumb up based on the image, but it turns out that it was a fake MRI image or inserted MRI data. So how can we ensure that we can maintain trust in something like healthcare AI? Well, I think this is a, a very important issue, and of course, we do not have the solutions to a, m m many of these mm -hmm. issues that in, in progress. But um, there are steps that would being put in place in actually for healthcare uh, AI in medicine research, for example. And um, I, I guess it comes back to the, uh, the, the the issue of building trust in the, dev the the applications that we build, and that actually comes in many different levels. First is that we will need to ensure that the algorithms, the, the way we develop the algorithms, validated and verified, in, in, is supposed to do the, the correct things it is it, supposed to do. And then when we build the applications, okay, and what kind of knowledge is going to be put into it, and part of it will be the expert knowledge, part of it will be the data, the, the insights derived from the data. Okay. And all those steps, um, some checks and also some uh, regulatory um, uh, uh, um, considerations have to be put in place, of course. Um, what kind of data we can use uh, to train the model, okay? And also, uh, for every step, uh, anything that has been put into it, um, it has to have a clear record. We may not be able to ensure the total correctness of a model based on all these data, but we need to have a clear track record of what has put into it. Mm -hmm. okay. This itself is a developing uh, um, a, a process, 
uh, we are st we're still trying to look at the best ways to do this. But the, I think the first recognizing the problem and also understanding what would be needed to put in place to ensure that the data that we put in, the knowledge that we put in, mm -hmm. uh, is accountable. I think that would be the first step. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Alpha is a great yes. example mm -hmm. because we already trust mm -hmm. doctors with our lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. And most doctors <laughs> we don't understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, most, most of us don't have the medical knowledge to be able to understand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our doctors. So what, why is it that we can put, put our, our lives in the hands of our, mm -hmm. our doctors? It's because we've set up the institutions mm -hmm. in which we're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. That I mean, we know that if our doctor mm -hmm. kills too many sure. of his or her patients, <laughs> they'll be struck off mm -hmm. if they prescribe drugs that are harmful to our health that those will be removed mm -hmm. from the medical register. Mm -hmm. So that there are institutions in place so that we can actually, without having to understand, mm -hmm. without having to go and examine everything ourselves, we can put our literally our lives in their hands. Mm -hmm. And the same will be true with, with AI in, in mm -hmm. medicine, is that we need the institutions so that, so that all of us can go in and with confidence trust our lives. Right. Well, that's obviously true in, in theory. However, the situation right now is, if we all go back to, let's say, um, AI systems based on machine learning, and obviously 98% of machine learning is supervised learning, where most of the labeled data, essentially, were generated in Western countries, advanced economies, let's put it in this way. I think the latest statistics I read was that the ImageNet data, I think about 80% of the images in the image net were labeled in the US and, and Europe. So that is probably the reason why most of the AI systems have data biases, where it's much more likely for an autonomous car to stop, to recognize and stop a male Caucasian white person rather than a black woman, for example. Now, and as Toby said, but given the fact that there are no international institutions that guarantee, for example, the data neutrality at this point, but the systems are deployed by commercial companies. But you so, don't want data neutrality. You want the system to be biased to Koreans in Korea. You want the system <laughs> to be biased to Chinese in China. No, but I mean, but then, then you're, you're talking about the world, but AI systems are optimized for the specific location with the specific gender, race, and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So this is not the kind of open society I think we're talking about. So you don't want to have a you know, Korean car that recognizes Koreans only disregarding maybe all the foreigners who are living in Korea. I don't think that's what we want to have, actually. We want to have a more international rules and regulations that tells you a, a minimal, so to speak, quality assurance that the system that's actually deployed in certain country needs to have certain data neutrality uh, requirement. Don't you think so? That's a dream. We, 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 we have different plugs in every country almost uh -huh. of the planet. We never got round to standardize electricity. Okay. We're not going to get round to standardize AI. Okay. We'll do it on a national level, and that will be adequate. Okay. Um, Europe is a f fantastic example of how it will apply its own rules. GDPR is a, is a wonderful example of how all of us have now got better data privacy. Mm -hmm. But other countries will decide where, you know, China will mm -hmm. decide a different sort of um, privacy reg regulation of itself, which will, will not be, I'm sure, will not be GDPR. Sure. You're not going to have, if you, if you ask for international standards, you sure. will end up with almost nothing. Because the lowest common denominator sure. across, the, across the world is almost no rights at all. Right. Well, but, you know, of course, universities are all about dreams, obviously, right? We are not talking, we are not living in real world. We are all living in ivory towers. So I think it is permissible as well as our prerogative to dream. What you are saying, Toby, is to apply the system of laissez-faire to AI world, so to not speak. Well. Not each at country, all. No, that's what you just said, that each country should decide for its own what kind of regulations uh, the country I should have. I have been a strong advocate that, that AI needs more regulation, that we have given the tech companies complete freedom right. to, to innovate, and that, that has brought wonderful uh, progress mm -hmm. uh, over the last 30-odd years. But now we're realizing that if, if it, you know, all markets will, will run to excess, sure. and we're seeing this market run to excess, mm -hmm. and that we do need... Um, to think about, you know, um, and actually, if you talk, I talk to my colleagues in the in the big tech companies, in the in the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, and the smart ones, they're all saying, yeah, we need regulation mm -hmm. because otherwise we're racing to the bottom. We don't actually want to go exactly. down there, yeah. but our competitors are going to do, go down right. there, so we have to do that. Sure. And you see that in the dis debate, for example, around the tech companies, mm -hmm. around face recognition. You see companies like Microsoft being actually quite responsible and saying, we need this space mm -hmm. to be regulated because other people are going to sell the software mm -hmm. otherwise. Sure. So we are going to come back to the point, but we need to get to Sean. Now, um, your center 
is named Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Now, life obviously is full of risk. Why do you think AI poses an existential risk rather than a normal risk, for example? Well, I mean, the answer is right now, I don't think so. I mm -hmm. think um, any existential risk associated with AI is a considerable way in the future. Again, pointing to this kind of, you know, 2062 kind of timeline. I think, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean mm -hmm. by normal risk. Um, I, I do think that there are decisions that we could make, that we make now that could influence the world in which we develop mm -hmm. more powerful technologies. And I think um, Toby's example of autonomous weapons is mm -hmm. a clear case of that, that if we go down a particular path, we will have much more powerful um, mm -hmm. uh, weapons that are enabled by A that will um, reach the level mm -hmm. of um, weapons of mass destruction, um, as Toby put it. Now, we, it seems to me that there's some role in influencing the global discussion around that mm -hmm. and perhaps not going down that road or going down that road in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are opportunities where we're not quite at that stage yet to influence mm -hmm. where um, it'll go. The mm -hmm. other aspect of where I think AI fits into a kind of a broader conception of mm -hmm. existential risk is how AI can help us with many of the risks that we face. So we are, I mean, the things that keep me up um, at night, I mean, I'm worried about a lot of the risks we talked about from AI, but I'm equally terrified, if not more so, about the rate at which we're failing to meet climate um, deadlines, mm -hmm. the um, rate at which we're wiping out species, the weight, um, rate at which we're using up resources. And AI is not a silver bullet and can't solve all of those problems, mm -hmm. obviously, but we need every tool at our disposal for these. And a lot mm -hmm. of these are sort of multifaceted, you know, um, things that involve lots of different nodes, lots of different um, data. I mean, if you look just at climate and energy, you know, you can use AI in climate modeling, in production of new materials, in more efficient um, energy grids, transport networks. Um, Google has been applying AI to, um, you know, make, um, wind energy more efficient um, and to make um, their cooling um, for their server farms mm -hmm. more efficient. You know, at scale, that's a major help, um, you know, if you deploy it in a lot of areas in dealing with this. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to sort of think about what role pa AI plays in global risks from both of these perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why I think about AI. I think it's a mistake to sort of frame it as just thinking about it in a threat because mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. it's something that we need in a very big way. We just need to develop it responsibly. Sure, I mean, we are all working in AI actually. So <laughs> I guess we all believe in the fundamental, so to speak, benefit that AI might bring. But obviously in this panel, so we are a little bit focused more on the on the risk side. Now, Chiyun, I saw in your slides that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that um, as usual, the government of Singapore does everything perfectly, everything well planned, um, very unlike uh, Korea. So now you have a precise plan about how to educate the future healthcare AI experts, what kind of curricula, how to train them. I got a little bit worried about, well, societies and universities are much slower than you know, the speed of technology these days, right? That's a mm -hmm. given effect. Now, you make this wonderful plan, you deploy it, but by the time you deploy it, maybe most of what you plan is already obsolete. What do you think about that? Uh, I need to clarify yeah. one point. Yeah. As I mentioned, um, what we presented for the AI talent yeah. plan is a proposal, is a policy recommendation that <laughs> I'm working on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I hope that you know, you'll be uh, adopted sometime soon, but uh, it's not that, yeah. not yet. All right, but um, a lot of the, uh, the coming back to your, your comments and a lot of the uh, recommendations that I've put in yeah. are already in place sure. in, in, in the university. Mm -hmm. We are already training uh, the, the, <coughs> the, the undergraduates and the graduates mm -hmm. in this way. We already have ex executive mm -hmm. education and we are actually have uh, working with the industry and also implemented the lifelong learning mm -hmm. component in, 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 mm -hmm. in the industry. So the, the plan that we're, we're looking at is actually to build upon what is currently available. And um, you're right, it's going to be a drastic change of the curriculum, the way we teach is going, not going to happen. Okay. And so the, 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 the assumptions that we make is to 
to work with the current infrastructure mm -hmm. and what can be achieved in the next uh, okay. five years. Very good. When, when so your only resource is people, it's a very smart investment, as far as I can see. <laughs> I already saw hands raised in the, in, the, mm -hmm. in the audience. I would like to ask maybe one last question to Toby, and then we can go to the audience. Um, I'm actually extremely interested about the international aspect as well as regulation because I'm also personally advising the Korean government and the National mm -hmm. Assembly right now about many of those aspects we talked about. I am, however, a little bit, um, how shall I say, um, um, pessimistic about the possibility of having on binding international regulation with respect to AI, maybe because the timing is not right right now. Well, mm -hmm. Brexit, Trump, the, the post-World War II international rule-based system is just about to break down right now. now